All right, welcome everybody. Go ahead and enter in the chat where you're at today, and hopefully you're not in one of those states where it's 120 something degrees in the shade. So I'm in Colorado and it's a lovely 85 degrees, and it's great to see so many familiar and new names in the participant list today. So thank you for joining us. My name is Megan Raymond, and I'm the Senior Director of Membership and Programs here at WCET. Kim's gonna share the link to the slides. We don't have much content, but if there's uh, anything that you're looking for those uh, in the slides, you'll have that link available. We are recording this and we'll share the link to the recording as well as any resources that were shared. We'll probably send that out early next week. As we go through the conversation today, feel free to engage in the chat. And then if you have a question, do enter that into the Q&A because sometimes we lose track of questions that are put in the chat. If you're interested in following along on Twitter, the hashtag is WCET Webcast. Today's moderator is Janelle Elias, and she's the Vice President of Strategy and Advancement at Rio Salado College. And she has also been active in the WCET Steering Committee Work Group on Microcredentials. She's a wonderful collaborator, collaborator and friend. And I'd like to go ahead and let her do an introduction, and then she'll kick off the webcast. Welcome, Janelle. Thank you, Megan. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm hailing from Tempe, Arizona, so it's probably about 115 degrees in the shade from Tempe. Um, but I work at Rio Salado College. We've been an online provider since the late 90s and an innovators in distance education since 1978. Um, as mentioned, I serve on the WCT steering committee and also the work group on micro-credentials. As a two-year public community college, Rio has a long history of um, stackable micro-credentials, certificates of completion that stack into uh, workforce opportunities or associate's degrees. And, and now we're even offering four-year degrees. So that's very exciting. I also have been selected to be a design lead with Ed Design Lab, which is leading national work in the area of stackable micro-pathways following human-centered design practices. And we're experimenting with digital skills badging to ensure those credentials can be digitally discovered. Um, Maricopa Community Colleges is a 10 college system. Four of our colleges are participating in the Community College Growth Engine Fund. So that's just a little bit of my lens, but I'm really pleased to moderate today and introduce some experts to you. I'm actually gonna turn over the mic and let um, Tanya introduce herself first. Tanya? Hi, um, I'm Tanya Justin. I'm a senior scientist and director of um, digital learning R&D at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, I also lead the National Research Center for Distance Education and Technological Advancements. So I'm not sure if I'm an expert in micro-credentialing, but I'm definitely trying to muddle my way through and um, learn more about it. At the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, we launched um, some of our first micro-credentialing programs over the last few years. And um, I have been involved in the micro-credentialing efforts there. So I'll be wearing my university hat um, as we talk about those things. Also at um, the National Research Center, which we call DATA, D-E-T-A, um, we've been um, putting forth some effort in order to develop a uh, micro-credentialing research and evaluation framework and toolkit um, to help us do some cross-institutional research to better understand micro-credentialing, but also to put together some resources, tools and instruments and those sorts of things to help um, folks across the country and internationally evaluate micro-credentialing on their campuses. And so some of the things I'll mention today are um, some efforts that we undertook over the past year, including a pre-convening at WCET's annual meeting in Denver in the fall. And so we've um, put together a summary of some of that information that we've gathered in a report um, that will be shared with you. And I'll be sharing some of that um, as we move through these questions um, that Janelle is, is going to facilitate for us. Thanks. Thank you, Tanya. I would consider you an expert by far. And thank you for your research and toolkit on the topic. We look forward to reading the report. Uh, next, we have Casey Thorne. Casey, would you introduce yourself and please share some of your perspective on the topic? 
Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Casey Thorne. I am the Senior Director of Skills Architecture with Western Governors University. Um, if you're unfamiliar with WGU, we are a fully online competency based organization. Uh, we've been around for about the last 26 years and since that time uh, we have been competency based the entire time. And uh, as part of our degree programs, we have always embedded industry certifications into our degree pathways. Um, for our students to earn that immediate return on their investment as they're working their way towards their degree. So we've done that for a long time and are um, just now over about the last two and a half years exploring our own kind of micro credentialing strategy to be able to bring even more value to our st students as they progress through their degree programs. Um, one of the ways that we do that and the primary focus of my work is understanding micro-credentials, how they fit and stack into our degree pathways and creating um, some theories and practices around valuing those micro-credentials in terms of the skills that are included in them um, and taking a little bit of the ambiguity out of what these micro-credentials mean for our institution, for our learners, but then also the employers that our learners ultimately end up sharing their achievements with. So. Um, I have a few resources over that time that we have cultivated to help that uh, we will share. Uh, one is a skills library that we have developed at WGU um, where uh, we've collected skills data over about the last five years working with our employer partners and make sure that that information is embedded in all of the micro credentials that we offer. Uh, we also have a unified credential framework that we've developed to help us make sense of how our credentials fit together and we'll share that as a resource for you all too. Excellent, thank you. Why don't we share that resource now? I think we have a slide with the, maybe a QR code. That's right. So if you just scan this QR code with your phone, it will take you to the uh, WGU Skills Library where there's a lot of rich skills data that you can use as part of a micro-credentialing program. You can use it um, as a source for helping students write resumes. It's, it's multifaceted in terms of its utility. Fantastic. Thank you for your pioneering work in that space. I have um, some questions, but I would encourage the audience to make this interactive. We had some objectives for the session today, so feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A and I'll be um, pausing to ask questions from the audience. But to get us started, let's just um, fundamentally, I want to address some of the readiness, planning, implementation, and evaluation of micro-credential strategies. So Tanya, why don't I start with you? Um, what was the process your institution used to define micro-credentials? Yeah, so um, there was a couple of things. We always do sort of an environmental scan to see what are other like-minded institutions doing. Um, we saw that the State University of New York system and the work they were doing had put um, together a really nice definition. Um, it wasn't just micro-credentialing, right? It was um, several definitions around micro-credentialing. So what is a micro-credential? What is um, sort of what we call a micro-credentialing or a cluster? Um, and then also talking more about micro-credentialing programming. Um, and so also we did sort of a review of some of the literature and environmental scan, um, you know, so we weren't recreating the wheel. Um, and that's sort of how we looked to develop our definition at the University for micro-credentialing. Um, at data, part of our um, efforts in the pre-convening were gathering information from the, you know, from the dozens of people that attended and asking them how they define it, because what we were looking for is not so much a definition, but when you're looking at efforts across institutions, you want to make sure that you have some commonalities, right? Like if we're going to do research on micro-credentialing or evaluate it, what is it? Um, everyone sort of has a different idea, especially if you look in different sectors. And so we needed to be able to identify some consistent characteristics that could tell us like, okay, this um, micro-credential can be included or this program or this institution can be, this doesn't quite fit the parameters that we have. Um, and so in the summary of the event um, that was shared here in the chat, you'll see some of those themes that we pulled out from the responses of the definitions that folks shared with us. So for example, you know, a real key is that it's a trusted assessment um, that it's actually the learning experiences, learner-centered, um, that it's flexible and manageable. And, and there's six um, characteristics there. 
um, that we're using to sort of um, as parameters again to know what is included as a micro credential. Thank you. I know at Maricopa Community Colleges, we were grappling with the same um, data definitions, challenges, how does it fit into our credentialing landscape? So we actually had to um, form a task force to take another look at our taxonomy for our credentials. So appreciate that research. Um, Kissy, what are your thoughts on the process your institution used to define micro-credentials? Thanks. So we took a similar approach in terms of um, looking at what was happening across a pretty broad landscape. Um, we knew we needed some kind of a structured taxonomy for how to understand micro-credentials at the university. And so we looked at a number of different frameworks. Um, we looked at uh, both frameworks here in the States, like your um, the DQL, Connecting Credentials. We looked at um, Europass. Um, we looked at some things that UNESCO has done. And from all of that, um, we also paired it against sort of um, workforce training taxonomies and moving across like different levels in a career pathway. And from that developed our own, what we've referred to as a unified credentialing framework, which um, explains how anything outside of a WD, WGU degree um, is a micro-credential at our organization, but the flavor of that micro-credential changes. So we have a structured taxonomy that I'm gonna share here actually in the chat with everyone. If you click on the link, um, it will take you to our unified credential framework where you can see the different levels and layers that we offer at our organization. Um, some of the primary principles around any of the credentialing we do, degree or micros, is that um, if we are issuing a credential to our student, it is backed by a trusted, uh, validated assessment experience, that it is um, underpinned with highly relevant workforce skills that we have included in those micro credentials. So that's where our work in the skills library came into play. Um, and that it's also um, a value to our students. So similarly, we've also taken a student-centric approach um, for any micro-credentials that we issue at the university. Um, the primary beneficiary should be the student. And so that's how we make the decision about when to issue a micro-credential um, is when it's a value to the learner. That's excellent. And some common themes there on um, the value proposition and the trusted assessment. I know with Ed Design Lab, we're following human-centered design criteria. One is that there's it's digitally discoverable, um, that we're doing you know, the skills-based learning and that there's combination of technology and soft skills. So really appreciate that. Um, do either of you wanna address further how you distinguish micro-credentials? Kesey, I heard you say that anything that's not a degree is considered a micro-credential, that's really interesting. You wanna elaborate on that and then we'll give Tanya a chance to respond. Sure, so um, in our credentialing framework, the way that we think about this is the degree is the primary, um, you know, we still believe like the primary goal that we want our learners working towards. And then anything aside from that, we call a micro-credential. But we've actually been um, pretty, cautious about how we use that word with our own internal like staff and faculty, um, as well as our students, because there's a lot of ambiguity to what it means. We've also been cautious in how we use the word badging, <laughs> because, um, you know, there's a lot of confusion around that as well, where any of the credentials that we issue as an organization, we could surface as a digital badge. So um, we try to steer away from using those two terms specifically and rely on this unified credential framework where we have the degree and then different flavors of those micro-credentials, which include specializations, um, competency level achievements, and certificates that we issue at the organization. And then of course, um, certifications that we will recognize, um, but do not issue on our own uh, at WG at this time. That's great. Thanks for sharing that resource. Tanya, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, similar thing. You know, this is different, right? It's not the same thing. Um, there's no overlap with other um, things that we're offering per se. I included here a link 
Um, as Casey talked about a taxonomy of the UWM's taxonomy. Um, and so people can link on that. Um, it's a micro-credential toolkit that Laura Pedrick and others put together. And so in there, when you click on the taxonomy, so we have like a competency-based education um, program, Flexible Wisconsin that we've been doing for years um, and other programs and so forth. And so this really dives into um, how micro-credentials are distinct from others. Um, however, you know, there's still very much the faculty are involved, the academic programs are involved and so forth. Um, and I also included Laura Pedrick's email address here. Laura Pedrick is our executive director of UWM Online and has been leading the initiative as well as this um, micro-credentialing toolkit, which is intended for um, our program um, leads or for chairs and deans of departments that some of you all might find really helpful. That's excellent. I'm going to keep the mic on you for a second. Could you address um, what stakeholders have been involved in the process of designing and implementing your micro credentials and how did you engage them? Yeah, before I jump to this, I just wanted to mention one thing about the importance of definitions. So I talked about the importance from it from a research standpoint, right? Like we need to know what the phenomena is and we need to make sure we're looking at, let's say, apples and apples and not apples and oranges and bananas and whatever. And I think Casey talked about this as well, and I'm sure they have a much more diverse um, array of definitions that they looked at because of um, their um, their student population and so forth and their industry partners. And so another thing to remember is that micro-credentials are about building awareness as well when we're defining them, right? So we need to make sure that um, the administration has a clear understanding and consistent understanding, our deans, our faculty, our students, um, you know, we developed an industry council and industry might have um, very different frameworks of, of which that they're looking at what is a micro-credentialing. Also, you know, how it may differ from, let's say, micro-credentialing being for credit core to the institution versus, you know, micro-credential more seen as a badge for um, something that isn't such a trusted assessment of, um, you know, a competency. So anyways, definitions are important. <laughs> um, making sure everyone's on the same page is really good. Um, and so um, stakeholders. So this is really interesting. Um, I'm always interested in stakeholders because I think a lot of times we think of evaluating quality or just um, ensuring quality as sort of after the fact. But those of us who have worked in this world for long enough know that who you get involved from the beginning or early on very much so is going to impact or influence the success of your initiative or any of those sorts of things. So part of um, and at UWM, you know, obviously a uh, tremendous job, you know, making sure faculty are involved right away, getting deans that are involved who are interested in launching micro-credentialing programs. Um, a lot of that ties into the for-credit, not-for-credit realm. You know, uh, while they, some of them are not for credit, we would like pathway to credit. Um, and so faculty and deans being involved in that is, is really key. Obviously, we want to ensure that we're meeting labor and industry demands. So we developed an industry council um, and they were part of this um, process as well. And then there's um, various units throughout the campus that um, participated. So, um, you know, from university relations um, to um, sponsorship, um, to marketing, registrar, you know, all of those sorts of things. And if you're looking for an extensive list, in the summary of the meeting, we had folks sort of brainstorm all of the stakeholders, and we ended up with dozens of stakeholders, but we sort of broke them into categories. So just so you guys know, the primary stakeholders that folks talked about were learners. I think a lot of times we um, tend to like build for learners and hope they come. And I guess it too matters if this is a business to consumer model or a business to business model. So it's something else you need to consider. But um, learners uh, really became like a key focus of this and, and making sure that we're talking to learners, but faculty, instructors, industry, accreditors was one that came up, administration, admissions, and then other sorts of external um, stakeholders were, were brought up as well. Um, and so anyways, just if you're looking for a more extensive list to help ensure quality of your program, if you're in the midst of, of launching, um, than uh, something to uh, think about as a resource there. Excellent, thank you for that thorough response. 
Casey, I have a few questions on the skills um, architecture that you shared. So I'll sh shift the mic over to you again. Can you share how the WGU skills is aligned to other skills mapping out there like Lightcast, for example? Can you speak to that? You bet. So um, when we, the department that I work in and our skills architecture function is fairly new to the university. We've been around for about the last five years or so. And our primary efforts were all focused around identifying what the high value skills are that our students need for the jobs that we have programming aligned to, um, where we have those high value skills embedded in our programs and uh, where we might have gaps that we need to address and fill. And so one of the first places that we looked was to um, existing taxonomies like Lightcast, um, MZ, it was Burning Glass and MZ at the time. Um, to help us, but what we know we can get from those kinds of insights are just broad categorical key terms. And we knew we needed to get deeper than that. Um, the context behind those key terms as any skill is applied in different settings varies widely, and we wanted to understand that more deeply. So we used um, basically the information that we got from Lightcasts of the world, uh, from um, other existing taxonomies like the like ONET, Bureau of, of Labor Statistics, um, and used that more as like a guiding light to then have conversations and engage with our employer partners, where we would take something like communication that was a broad skill that showed up across every program and job as a high demand skill, but really unpacked it with those employers to say, all right, when you say you need a software engineer with good communication skills, what does that mean? Who are they communicating with? What are they communicating about? What are the tools and technology they're using to communicate? And at the end of that, we would hear things back like, well, our software engineers need to be able to communicate changes in code to other engineers, but also to um, you know, novice stakeholder groups who are not engineers. And that heart of performance then is what we started to build our skills library around. So each of those key performances now is linked to taxonomy information from Lightcast. It's linked to Bureau of Labor Statistics um, and ONET job codes. It's linked to any uh, relevant industry certifications, um, any academic frameworks. Um, and from that is how the WGU skills library evolved. So we have all of this really rich data um, that is employer driven, employer informed that then we use as the foundation for any credential that we develop at the university. Excellent. There was a question that just elaborate a little bit more on that thought. Can you give an example of how you actually utilize the skills library in designing and developing a micro credential at WGU? You bet. So again, the first thing that we always ask when we have an idea for a micro credential, and these really come from a lot of different places within our organization. It could come from faculty. It could come from um, our workforce intelligence uh, function. It could come from students. It could come from marketing. When we know that there's a micro credential that we want to explore, what we end up doing is some additional workforce research to see like, is there any kind of signal to us that this micro credential is in demand? Is it in student demand? Um, have there been conferrals uh, where other um, micro credentials like this have been issued? Um, but then we turn the lens to student value. So if we're going to build this micro credential, how can we make it of the most value to our learners? What are the skills that are in the highest demand that we wanna make sure we have embedded into it? So that's where the WGU skills library comes into play is we will go and source any of the given skills within that library that are aligned to jobs that would benefit from this micro credential and make sure that those are foundational to the development of the curriculum and the assessments for that micro credential. And then when we end up actually issuing the digital credential to our learners, any of those skills, um, the rich skills descriptors from the library that you all now have access to um, is embedded as metadata within that credential. So as our student then goes on to share it, um, it is transparent to them, transparent to employers or any other education institution, what the skills were that they had to actually demonstrate in order to earn that credential. That's helpful. I think there was a request in the chat for maybe some more definitions. I don't know if you're able to address that one. 
directly, but I really appreciate that example. Uh, there's been some questions about how do you communicate or help the students and employers understand the value of a micro-credential? So Casey, we'll start with you and then we'll let Tanya address that question as well. The value proposition, how do you communicate it to students and employers? Yeah, so the way that we approach it at WGU is we communicate it by way of skills. Um, we really believe that skills have evolved to become the language of the workforce. And so um, we try to take a skills lens when communicating that value with our students. At the end of this micro-credential, these are the skills that you're going to have demonstrated. This is how you may want to include them on a resume. This is how you could share this micro-credential with employers. The employer side of it is is interesting and um, we're kind of coming at it from two dif different directions right now. One is if there's a micro credential that we want to build, we want to make sure that we're engaging employer partners from the beginning so they can help us build the value into the micro. So it's not we're trying to sell them on the value prop. They're helping us define the value prop. Um, we know that's really critical. And then the second, you know, Kind of way that we're we're doing this as well is if we have like specific employer partners that are having a hard time sourcing employees in a particular job role and just having a discussion to say look if we created a micro in this area like is this a pipeline that you would be interested then in hiring students from so we're coming at it from the skills perspective we're coming at it from the micro perspective but really i think the importance in this is not selling them on the value prop it's engaging them in building the value prop. Great point, that co-creation and employer validation during the design is critical. We might have lost Janelle, Tanya, did you wanna answer that question? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, so, I mean, very similar. And so a lot of our development of this, it's just sort of not any um, program on campus necessarily is going to launch a, a micro credential. Um, so we wanted to make sure that there's relevance. And so like Casey was saying, I think a lot of that is very important in our work with industry to identify skills um, that they're looking for. So identifying, um, you know, working with um, different regional and national industry partners to sort of identify um, areas of growth that they need to fill. And so working with them to launch those programs. So for example, um, cybersecurity is something that we definitely need um, more folks in the workforce with that expertise. So cybersecurity was also something as as Katie mentioned, that came up on um, burning glass, like all of these skills around that, our work with the Business Higher Education Forum Roundtable, um, with Manpower, with um, Microsoft, and sort of knowing that this is um, something very valid. We also did market research um, uh, to sort of uh, validate that as well, that this is the direction we should be going. We also knew um, between our information, School of Information Studies, our College of Engineering, and our School of Business that uh, we had expertise here that we were able to um, work together in order to launch this program or this pathway. Another one obviously was in data science and artificial intelligence as um, we are offering uh, minors and graduate programs um, in our School of Engineering for artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, we look to, uh, to you know, harness that sort of expertise um, into another um, pathway that um, or program that we had started developing for artificial intelligence as well. Beyond sort of what Casey was mentioning, um, sort of the skills, um, just to sort of try to add something here, beyond the fact that it's skills, that there's demand for it, that there's job placement through our industry partners, that we're filling a gap with industry. I think the other thing that higher ed, and this actually was one of the top research questions that came up um, in sort of what is the value of higher ed in this space. Um, and going back to sort of one of the key components, we kept hearing about this like trusted assessment from a credible organization. And that's one piece of what higher ed has to offer. This isn't like X, Y, and Z company from somewhere that's saying like, this is a credential. This is obviously a reputable university um, we also have decades of experience in, um, in innovative forms of programming. So um, blended learning, online learning, competency-based education. And so 
not only do we have um, obviously um, our brand in order to be a trusted assessment and the expertise, but we also have um, you know decades of experience in learning um, design and development and using digital modalities. And so I think that's another piece of it. We're not new to learner-centered um, uh, design. Um, we have expertise on campus and beyond. And so I think um, being that university who is trusted regionally to provide that assessment, the micro-credentialing means something. Um, our relationships with industry are strong. We've had them for a very long time. Um, and so I think all of that as part of the strategy um, really helps us um, have value in who we are in this landscape. Awesome, great point. Thank you. And sorry, I muted myself earlier. So appreciate that. Probably lost um, you there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to do this from my mobile device. So good times. Um, there was a question in the chat. Are you all seeing any disconnect between what industry says they need for skills and what you're actually experiencing as you design and start running students through micro credentials? Tanya, do you want to address that question? Sure. As the um, person with the background in communication and has uh, taught in the soft skills um, for over 20 years, I think one of the things is, is that we're seeing a real push for sort of technical skills. Um, you know, uh, we're looking for more, uh, let's say, connected systems, cybersecurity, um, machine learning and, um, and AI um, skill set using Python or, or these sorts of things, right? It seems like it's more on the technical side. Um, at the same time, um, we're also hearing a lot that we still, um, that um, industry has gaps as far as things like critical thinking. Like, great, we have a person that can run um, Excel or point by and um, do these reports, but can they actually um, problem solve, critically think, communicate verbally, um, work as a group to solve some of, let's say, um, an issue that would come up in one of the reports. So I think um, often we have problems with, um, with still missing some of those um, basic skills um, and some of the um, you know, micro-credentials that we are developing. So while we have this in our general curriculum on our campuses, um, you know, why, um, why we run to push forward the technical, I think we need to make sure that we're building in some of the social components or the soft skills and this is the same thing when we're talking about some of our biomedical programs as well, biomedical engineering and so forth, is that we, we need to not just build in the technical competencies. We need to make sure that we're building in some of the other social, um, you know, organizational and those sorts of um, soft, I hate that word soft skill, but um, some of those softer, uh, more necessary pieces as well when we're building out these micro-credentials. Yeah, that even those have those skills have a lot of names, right? Durable skills, transferable, 21st century, soft. Um, so I think that's interesting. Durable. I like it. Durable <laughs> skills. Question. Um, I'm gonna direct this one back to Casey, I think. Let me see. There was a question in the QA. We'll start with Casey. So Casey, can do you have any advice that you can give us on governance and policy? surrounding micro-credentials. And when you think about that, there was a specific question about how much is this centralized or decentralized at each of your universities? We'll start with Casey. Yeah, so we actually have a function um, in my larger department that is uh, specifically around credential integrity. And at WGU, we come from a, a you know, different spot than I think a lot of other higher ed institutions do in that we use a master curriculum. We have a disaggregated faculty model. Um, so our approach with governance over micro-credentialing is centralized. And as part of our workforce intelligence and credential integrity efforts, we have a team that is specifically um, there to help basically with those checks and balances um, to make sure that any credential that we end up offering is of value to the students, that it aligns to our unified our unified credential framework, um, that the assessment that we have associated with that micro credential has integrity to it, that the skills that we say are included in this micro are actually there and we have had the, le the learner demonstrated at the end. So it is very much a, a central function um, at WGU, which I think has has its benefits and its challenges too. 
Thank you. I'm going to come back to you in a minute. Tanya, how about you? Do you, how centralized versus decentralized? Do you have any suggestions on governance and policy? Hmm, good times. Um, so obviously um, the University of Wisconsin system is faculty governed um, and that's why we have faculty and deans and so forth involved right from the beginning. So I think you definitely need to be thinking about your institutional structure, your system structure be when you're developing the strategy for your micro-credentialing program. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's certain pieces that, um, that you develop that and, and policies that are going to need to go through um, the approval process at potentially your institution through faculty governance um, and, and possibly through other governing bodies and then also potentially through your system. Um, and so um, Cynthia Proctor from SUNY talks often about how they spent a couple years just getting those pieces into place. I think that's really um, critical. Um, you know, some people think, well, launch a micro-credentialing program in a few months. And, um, and not all universities can do that. Um, it's going to take some pieces to get it uh, moving through. And so, yeah, just something to think about that ahead of time. Yeah, great advice. We had a form a task force to help us with that taxonomy mm -hmm. bit, definitions, and then yeah. just some governance so that it doesn't turn into the Wild West with 10 independently accredited institutions as part of a right. system. Oh, and Janelle, um, I should mention yeah. that too quick. Um, also with the organizational structure, uh, not just thinking about governance and about um, policy, I think it's also important to think about what processes are happening centrally and are centrally supported in your academic affairs units. Yeah. And then what um, processes or practices are going to be happening at the school or college or at the departmental level, depending on the size of your university and, and maybe how many schools or colleges you have within it. Um, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, something that I think has made us very successful over the past few decades is that we always have centralized um, support to some degree um, to help uh, with strategy, to help launch programs um, with learning experience um, and development um, support, faculty development, and those sorts of things. And then also um, each school or college has their own support systems that they've uh, helped in complementing um, those sorts of mechanisms. And so I think that's really something to think about um, if you are developing a micro-credentialing program is sort of what things can you have central um, to the academic affairs of the institution um, and what other things um, can be more decentralized. Great point, and that'll vary depending on your organizational structure. I know we're running up on time, so I want to ask you each one big question, try to answer it in about two minutes or less, and then we'll, we'll turn it back to Megan. My question is, Tanya, if you were to start over again from square one, what would you do differently and why? Um, that's a great question. I reviewed that and had an answer and now it flew out of my head. Um, but I think one of the things is um, better understanding what the quote unquote product would look like, what you actually want this learning experience um, to look like, what do you want the user experience to be, um, and those sorts of pieces. You know, we've been doing um, blended and online programming since the 90s, and we've been doing um, competency-based education, um, sitting in the learning management system with some other pieces to it. A lot of it is modularized, of course, um, for scaffolded learning, you know, aligning with research-based pedagogical and design practices. But, you know, um, is this going to be the same or is it gonna look different? Um, how is this going to be um, produced? What is the final product? Talking about sort of, again, like the media, um, the modalities, the um, way information will be conveyed, um, more sort of the specific nuts and bolts of what this will look like at the end. I think, um, you know, you can develop a strategy, you can identify a need, um, you can get all of the stakeholders at the table and so forth. Um, and it takes far more resources than I think we were thinking. So also having resources in place and resources when you need more resources. So um, folks within your institution or with your industry partners that are willing to invest in this, 
um, and differentiate from what institutions, I'm sorry, what industry is already able to offer with their own workforce training, um, but really understanding at the end of the day, what are the nuts and bolts of what this is going to look like, what this experience is going to look like, whatever length it is, whatever your um, sort of uh, time, um, temporal sort of alignment with uh, the learning experience is going to be. It's great advice. And Megan's um, flagging that we do have a little more time. So we'll give that question to Casey and then I'll go through some additional questions that the audience has dropped in our Q&A panel. Casey, is there anything so, you would do differently? <laughs> yeah, uh, lots of things. Um, I think we spent uh, a lot of time, we were really thorough in terms of understanding like how we wanted to make sure that value underpinned our micro strategy, that we understood how any of the micro credentials relate to one another, getting that taxonomy solid at our organization. Um, we similarly spent a lot of time on strategy, but I think when it came down to the actual like tactics of execution is where I think um, I would go back and spend some more time there. Um, things that that have tripped us up there's a lot of technology um considerations about how you know existing systems that we use we might have to um hack a little bit to execute on the the micro strategy in the way that we want to um another thing i think that um we're learning so i don't know that we could like really go back but um, micro credentials in terms of the student population that may be interested in taking them, how you're delivering them. There's really a different kind of um, support service, like wraparound services that that you should think about as well. Um, it's not as easy as, um, you know, at WGU, just using the same kind of faculty structure, disaggregated faculty model to just execute on a different kind of credentialing program. They need their own um, you know, support service, everything from, you know, financing to how we're enrolling those students to what a community of care looks like to help them and support them through um, getting that credential at the end. So I think those are the biggies. It's it's the actual like nuts and bolts of how you start to execute. Um, what are the technology limitations you might be experiencing and considerations for different support models that you need to offer learners in these programs. That's great advice. And I heard in that how you keep that user centric design occurring and really that focus on the student journey is critical in both of your answers. So thank you. Okay, is there, does anyone know, is there a taxonomy of skills that's emerging as being most commonly used in higher ed? So um, I don't know that we will ever get to a day where there is one taxonomy to, to rule them all. Um, what I will say is there has been a large effort um, within the Open Skills Network where there are a lot of higher education institutions, employers, military, both national and inter international organizations coming together to better understand skills um, and to not necessarily create a structured taxonomy where we have the same definition for every skill, but the way that the data for that skill is represented is similar. So that it allows organizations to have, you know, the freedom to define skills um, as they will, but the way that they're translated across systems and organizations um, can be a little bit tighter. So if you have not checked out the Open Skills Network, I would direct um, people there because there is a, a pretty significant growing effort there. That's great. I'm going to move on because there is a lot of questions. So reminding the audience, please drop your questions in the Q&A panel so I can access them. Um, one of, the next question, Tanya, we'll start with you. How are you seeing the micro-credentials are funded or the funding model around it? Um, and to what extent are they financial aid eligible? Those are great questions. Um, you know, we at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee became part of the credential as you go, C-A-Y-G, for some of you aren't familiar, they're developing um, some really amazing resources. Um, and I was in a webinar, um, I think last month, um, with, uh, they had the um, folks from the different accrediting agencies talking about micro-credentials and and it felt um, really fantastic to know that the accrediting agencies are proponents of this and open to this new innovation and aren't, you know, seeing it as um, they're going to be skeptical of hampering or hampering in any sort of way, which sometimes we've thought of them as barriers. But 
more or less enhancing their understanding and, and how do they just ensure um, you know, quality in comparison to other things. And one of the big questions also that came up um, sort of on a parallel path here in the um, convening that we had, uh, the pre-convening was um, sort of this like um, credit versus for credit, like how do we answer the questions around this? Um, and in the CAYG, it came up the idea of financial aid was the big thing. What is the U.S. Department of Ed doing about this? Um, you know, uh, will there ever be a chance to award financial aid? And this is not new. I know the U.S. Department of Ed, um, not quite 10 years ago, but for a very long time, has be, been thinking about how financial aid could be awarded for alternative sorts of learning experiences. Um, they have, you know, um, put out some proposals for the EQUIP program, and, and some of that work has moved forward with the jobs for um, the future organization. Um, but I think the thing is, is the financial aid question hasn't been answered and the for credit, not for credit hasn't necessarily been answered. Now, what we've done at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee um, is that we're assuring that our skills um, in our, our micro-credentialing programs aligns with our curriculum to some extent, that the learning experience, the curriculum and the experiences are designed and developed with faculty cohorts. Um, and so while um, they are not for credit at this point, there is a pathway to credit um, that uh, could work out. And so that's what we're doing. Um, there also is a plan in the future that some of them would be for credit. And when it comes to awarding, um, and also, oh, there's so many ideas in answering this question. Um, you know, we also had to go through this with the competency-based education program and sort of coming up with a credit, of, um, a credit comparative, right? So um, the 144 hours that you would um, for a course, you know, what does that transcribe into competencies? And then how do we award financial aid credit? Like Casey mentioned, our system <laughs> Um, didn't work. Our um, technology system did not work for our competency-based education program. So we had to sort of build another shoestring um, sort of back end one in order to handle that. So there is the policy piece with the U.S. Department of Education. When can we start um, or when will they push the um, push through the way there so that financial aid can be um, rewarded for these alternative things? And at that time, you know, are you preparing your institution for that to happen? So, um, and this will be part of accreditation, right? So your learning objectives have to align with your curriculum. Are they comparable and how they are achieved um, quality wise? Um, do you have the technology infrastructure in place to um, document um, these competencies, the assessments of these competencies? Um, that then can be, um, you know, talking to the other system that will actually have the financial data and information for this to be awarded, or how is this being built into a prior learning assessment um, that may have the potential for financial aid as well. So there's, um, there's a lot of pieces here. I think that's a, a really complex question. And so I'm not sure if Casey has um, other strategies they're using there. But please share if you have strategies at, at your campus and how you're dealing with the for credit, not for credit financial aid um, sort of realm. Yeah, Casey, I'm going to give you the mic and maybe just add a question because there's a, a good one to follow on. Are you, do you have any examples of barriers from accreditation that you've encountered in addition to some of this regulatory um, challenges? So, um, I will say yes and no. The, the regulatory challenges are a big one, um, but as far as accreditation goes, the way that we're approaching our, our micros right now is that any of our students that are engaged in the micro-credentialing program are enrolled in the full degree program. And so offering them as just kind of standalone is a challenge that we are um, exploring right now. Um, launching standalone micros through our WGU um, Academy as kind of a, an on-ramp prep into the WGU degree program. So we have yet to, to really face those accreditation challenges, but um, to, or to Tanya's point, um, making sure that you have documentation of the assessment method, how the competencies are demonstrated, the learning outcomes that are being assessed um, is, is critical. 
Um, there's a question about learning a little bit more about these wraparound supports that you said there was some distinctions that you're finding and we'd love to learn more about any advice or clarification there. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I think there it's kind of the big like university areas, right? And what I'm trying to say with this is you can't just take a existing model for how you deploy uh, degree programs and believe that same model is going to work for a micro-credentialing strategy. So um, I think we've had a lot of discussions already about like financial aid considerations. Um, what do the enrollment considerations look like? Students that need to be supported in a short form uh, credential, what does that like faculty support look like? At WGU, we have um, program mentors that follow our students through their entire degree program. You know, are we um, having that same structure for the micros where they have not only a program uh, champion basically, but also the course faculty that engages with them at a course level? Um, what other kinds of scholarship opportunities might you be looking at for a micro credential that may or may not be available um, as they would be for degree programs? So I think I think it's just looking at all of the different functions that you have within a university and the support services that you offer your students and just knowing that it's it's not just deploying that same tactic on a smaller scale to support a micro program. Great advice. There was a question, you can speak to it or Tanya can address it, if this is being housed primarily out of the online or the digital teaching and learning part of the organization. But at WGU, you explained that it was, obviously it's all online, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. How about you, Tanya? Are you finding that this is organized under the online arm of the institution? And can you speak to any wraparound supports that you've felt are distinct to this offering? So something a little distinct in um, the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee is we don't have an online arm. Um, so our academic programs are academic programs. They're core and central to the university, uh, whether they are on-site, face-to-face, uh, blended or hybrid or fully online. Um, and so there is no sort of separate place for those. So any of the resources that are, um, you know, central to our university are available to sort, support any programs, including some of the innovative ones. Now, we did um, develop additional resources as we were sort of developing um, pilots and models of some of the micro-credentials that were being developed. Um, you know, in order to come up with a mechanism that would work in order to um, develop the micro-credentials and, and the learning experience that surrounded those. Um, there's a question about more tactically, what's the team look like that's in the design and development process? Um, so either of you can address this, but I imagine you have a, a faculty subject matter expert. Are you doing it all in-house? Is there any combination of off the shelf? Tanya, I'll start with you. Yeah. So, um, so usually what we did was first, like um, Casey and others were talking about, is first of all, figuring out the competencies, right? And they weren't, although it's um, focused on skills, they're not necessarily all skills. And so we still were um, developing competencies. Um, and these competencies were developed with not a faculty um, subject matter expert, but with a team of faculty. So, um, for example, on the data science pathway, we had a team of faculty from different schools or colleges that had different expertise in which we developed um, not only the competence for, um, for micro-credential, but more uh, start building towards a complete pathway. Um, and so that's uh, in part where the faculty expertise came. Then there was sort of approval of those competencies. Um, they went to industry council to sort of validate those competencies that these were aligning with them. Um, there is, re um, as far as the learning experience, design and development, um, the instructional design, the pedagogical piece and or the technology piece, there are folks on campuses on campus that are experts um, in that. And then also we did um, partner with third party vendors um, to help with some of the more advanced um, media development. And also at this time, it wasn't centrally um, resourced as, um, because we were sort of still in pilots. Um, and so that's also why some of those mechanisms were used. Uh, we couldn't take people off of 
um, other things that were going on during the pandemic, by the way, um, and, um, and working on some of these things. So we um, brought in some third party um, folks to help. That's a really helpful model to understand. Casey, would you like to address what the team looks like that designs and develops the micro-credentials? Yeah, so just by way of, you know, how WGU operates with our disaggregated faculty model, we have um, an arm of faculty responsible for um, the research around the skills, the workforce relevance that then feeds into our academic teams who help us select the skills um, that are necessary for the program. They are engaged in developing the competencies. Um, and then we have a separate faculty team of program designers who then create that learning pathway. Um, they're designing the assessments. We have um, a, a staff of psychometricians that help us with the assessment creation and builds. Um, we also have then our faculty uh, that we engage because they're going to be supporting the students as they're progressing through the micro-credentials. So they are also part of the academic house that's engaged in building it. So there are many hands involved in the process, many departments across the way. Um, and it sounds like uh, Tanya, it's very similar for you all as well. Thank you for sharing. I wanna thank you both for sharing your wisdom. There's been some incredible um, ideation in the chat as well. So I'll turn it back to you, Megan, and, and thank you both for your time today. Great, thank you. Thank you, Janelle, Casey, and Tanya. That was a wonderful conversation. And thank you for everybody for sharing in the chat. Um, that was equally as valuable to me. So again, any resources that were shared, we'll be sure to pull those links out and share them via email with a link to the recording next week. And if this is your first WCET webcast, or event, we'd love you to get on our website and learn more about the work that we do. We have lots of resources available on our website. We're always doing events such as a monthly webcast. And um, for members, we have monthly closer conversations. And next month, our theme will be around enrollment trends. So we'll be doing a webcast as well as a member only closer conversation with our friend, Phil Hill. Um, coming up soon, well, it's not very soon, but it feels soon because we're doing tons of work on it already. We have our annual meeting in New Orleans, and this year it will be in conjunction with ASWI, the annual summit for women in e-learning, and that was formerly IFWI, if you're familiar with that organization. So get on our website, registration and program are live. Lastly, I'd like to thank our annual sponsors that underwrite our programs and events here at WCET and make much of this work possible our supporting members. And lastly, thank you again for attending and thank you so much to our wonderful panelists. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye all.